let's say some guard, um, you know, beats you or something, you still could sue civilly for that. This is just what we call the moral claims bill. Now, why would the state agree to that? This was interesting politically. Why would the state agree to something like this when Texas doesn't even give their people an apology? Randall Adams has never even gotten an apology, let alone a dime from Texas. They claim sovereign immunity. Well, Ohio could have claimed sovereign immunity too and said you can't sue us for this. But they decided to do it. Why? Well, because once in a while somebody goes to the legislature and says I was wrongfully convicted, they marshal a lot of support, and they get a bill through the legislature and they get millions of dollars. They might get a million dollars. Now usually it's, it's reduced later you know, on appeal, but they might get a lot of money. Now the state can't budget for that. This is an unexpected drain on the state treasury. The state would rather, one of the first questions they asked me was, how often does this happen, Dr. Huff? What is the base expectancy rate? So by, by having some estimate, they would rather put this in the state budgeting process and plan that every year there are probably going to be some errors and we're going to have to pay some money. And it makes it more predictable for them than this sudden windfall sort of uh, claim on the state treasury. Well, you know about the Illinois mor moratorium. Let me quote from a, a book that uh, Frank Zimmering, we just offered him a distinguished professor position. He's at Berkeley. He wrote a book recently uh, on the, the capital punishment. And here's, Zimmering says, um, a process of social engagement with capital punishment that is without precedent in American history has already begun. The end game in the effort to purge the United States of the death penalty has already been launched. The length and the intensity of the struggle necessary to end the death penalty are not yet known, but the ultimate outcome seems inevitable. Now in our book, we recommended the death penalty should be abolished and replaced with sentences of 20 years, 30 years, or life without parole. And I believe the American public, if they're given the option that a person could do life without parole, truly not be paroled, would be willing to substitute that for the death penalty because of the possibility of error. Recent public uh, opinion surveys show that. <coughs> Samuel Gross at Michigan recently found that a majority of Americans surveyed, both supporters and opponents of the death penalty, indicated that the issue of innocence causes them great concern about the propriety of the death penalty. And finally, if we would abolish it, it would bring us in line with other nations who have done so. For example, I just came back from Switzerland, Finland, and Russia. The European Union, you cannot be a member of the European Union if you have the death penalty. The countries that had it had to drop it before they were accepted into the European Union. And guess who dropped it? Russia. President Putin says he has no intention of reinstituting the death penalty. But we have it. And the final irony to me, you have a terrorist situation, right? Let's say somebody kills um, 100 Americans, let alone 3,000 Americans in New York City. And they're, they're captured in a foreign country. And the foreign country does not have the death penalty. So what do they do? The U.S. asked for extradition, right? We want this guy back to put him on trial. And what does the foreign country say? Inevitably, you know, all the time. What do they say? Not if you're going to give him the death penalty. So we are now in the position of saying, okay, we promise not to execute this guy, send him back, the most he'll ever get is life in prison. But for an American citizen who committed some other murder, we don't make that offer even though they might be innocent. So, so it seems to me that we can't really hold this situation very long. And finally, um, in 360 BC, one of the world's great philosophers, Plato, made the following observation in the Republic, one of the, uh, probably the finest Socratic dialogue. Mankind censure injustice, fearing that they may be the victim of it, and not because they shrink from committing it. So, you know, the more things change, the more they remain the same. But I think that uh, we have to do something about this problem. We're beginning to look at it more systematically. In Switzerland, we had the first international workshop in August, just a couple months ago, on wrongful conviction across nations and cultures. I had suggested we get together a, a group of scholars from around the world and start to compare the types of errors made in different kinds of justice systems and different nations. So we had people from all over Europe and uh, formerly communist nations and Canada and the United States, all sponsored and paid for by the Swiss National Science Foundation, which is an interesting thing in itself. And we want to keep this group together. We found out some very interesting things. Um, the, uh, for example, there was a man there from Poland 
And he was kind of apologetic to me. He said, oh, you know, my paper is so different than the rest of them. I said, no, no. That's one of the great things about your paper. Because he broke his paper down into wrongful convictions under the communists that were politically motivated versus wrongful convictions that have taken place since the communist regime fell. Now, to me, that's a wonderful topic. And so we found lots of interesting things. We're trying to um, start out by having a template of research in our own country, starting with homicide, because we, don't, we have the data problem, right? That's not, a lot of times the data are not comparable for all these different types of crimes. They're called different things. But with homicide, you've got a body, and it's pretty standardized. And we think we're going to start with those kinds of cases. And then finally, um, I got appointed to a, um, the ABA Committee on Innocence, which is the American Bar Association. And I'm on the subcommittee about uh, police behavior. So we have um, uh, some pretty prominent police people. James Fife, who's a former New York City cop, who's uh, an academic, but now is deputy commissioner of uh, New York Police Department in charge of training. Uh, we have Patrick Murphy, who was the former chief of New York and Detroit and several other places. Um, my colleague, Commander Schaefer from the Columbus Police Department. Jack, um, the uh, chair of the committee, is a uh, law professor at the University of Arizona, formerly at the University of Cincinnati. And what, one of the things we're trying to do is have black letter recommendations for uh, the police as well as uh, more elaborate text about how the police can improve their training in order to reduce these cases of wrongful conviction. One thing I've been pushing for is in all the police academies, they should, pre they should present cases involving wrongful conviction, and especially those where the cops, usually unknowingly, contributed to the wrong outcome. So that they're confronted with the fact that their decisions are very important, people's lives are at stake, and just because they think this is a scumbag, they better not come to premature closure because if they do, the leads to the real suspect, the real offender, may dry up and they're compromising <coughs> public safety.